started back to the basics here at uh, GGU Presents. Um, my name is Mark Singer. I'm the Dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies here at uh, Golden Gate University. I'm really excited to uh, be back here again. And uh, especially excited to be back here with, uh, with my good friend, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Yergler, who is uh, Professor of Management and Department Chair at uh, Golden Gate University. We work uh, together regularly. So uh, it's always, but it's always been great to uh, talk with Jeff. And, and uh, this is the first in our series of conversations with uh, Dr. Yergler um, about leading and managing during turbulent times. Uh, we started talking a little bit about this about two months ago. And um, the response was great. And we want to continue on with those uh, discussions because there's just so much to cover. I, I should also mention that, uh, that Dr. Yergler is a uh, principal for integer leadership and has been uh, doing that work since uh, 2004. He's got quite a colorful uh, background history, but uh, welcome, Jeff. Uh, glad to see you back again. Great. Thanks, Mark. It's good to be here again. Yeah. Good to be working with you. And starting a very exciting uh, series uh, that's going to be very important, certainly moving forward in this time of rapid change and disruption. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, it's great. Well, you know, I mean, this is especially relevant this past year because of uh, just, well, it's in our title during the, because of the turbulence of, of, of this uh, year that we've experienced year and probably not entirely done yet with that year. Um, but, but I think this is always really important work that you're doing and, 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 and you're addressing a lot of really important questions and regardless of, of the context, you know, this past year. Um, so, so today we're gonna to talk about culture, which is something that uh, I don't think a lot of people even are aware uh, is as essential as it is for, uh, uh, for any kind of an organization, workplace or, or otherwise. Um, so I, why don't we just start out by figuring out what we're talking about? What, what do we mean when we talk about an organization's culture? Yeah, yeah you're right, Mark. Um, and I think probably everybody who's watching would agree that uh, anytime the word culture comes up as it relates to an organization, people kind of uh, glaze over. It's like, they don't really understand. Many of them are just plain confused, and maybe they've heard the term before, but uh, it's, it's amorphous and oftentimes not clear. So when we talk about a culture, we're talking about the way that a particular organization kind of does its business, the way they, the way they treat employees, the, the vision, the mission, the core values, <clears throat> uh, the rules, the policies, the norms for behavior, for conduct, for performance. Um, it's, it's the rituals. It's kind of what an organization does to reinforce what it believes and how it works with people to uh, make sure that, that they have what they need to be successful. So every organization has a culture. Um, some of it you see, uh, for example, symbols, signs, colors, um, uh, events, what people wear to work. Uh, or where virtually. Um, so some things you see uh, that point to the larger culture, then other aspects of culture are invisible. You don't see them. Uh, and they oftentimes, the invisible components of culture are what can get you in trouble. Because if you don't know they're there, if you don't know the standards are there, the expectations, you kind of walk into them by mistake, then, then you'll probably be told pretty quickly, you know, we don't do that here. You know, we don't say that here. This is how we do this. This is how we do that. So culture is difficult to understand <clears throat> because a lot of it, you just simply don't see within an organization. You may sense it, you may feel it. Some of it you may see, uh, but oftentimes uh, a culture is, is not, not uh, you can't touch it, you can't feel it. You can sense it, sometimes you can see it. Uh, mm -hmm. But by and large, it's oftentimes difficult to define so and difficult to experience and see. Wow. So it's, that's really interesting. It, it, it's very much like what I remember studying in anthropology. I, I mean, it, it, in anthropology, you would talk about a society's culture, you know, Japanese culture, American culture, something like that. What you're saying is that organizations have something similar, that the, the sort of the pieces that, that hold the place together. Yeah, they don't. Or, uh, or they, they have a, a culture that doesn't hold together. Uh, it's, it's dysfunctional. So, you know, we'll talk about that later, I know. But um, yeah, you, you kind of know it when you're there, you know, it's kind of when you walk into someone's house, it's a family system. Every, by the way, every group, every team, 
<clears throat> every department, uh, every organization has a culture. Whether or not they know what it is or whether or not they've become consciously aware of the importance of building it, sustaining it, defining it, every group of individuals interacts together in a certain way. Uh, and, and that can just really go all the way up to the, the entire organization. So you know when you're in it, uh, you can see it, you can feel it. Um, and sometimes when you can't see it, you can't feel it. It's, it's a bit more difficult to navigate. I see. So, so how does that get established? I mean, it, is it just this sort of amorphous thing that evolves or can people like sort of set a culture in a particular way? How does that work? Well, uh, great, great question. Um, that's been studied for years, a, a number of great articles uh, that have been written about how culture is framed up, <clears throat> how it's defined. There's two, way to look, two ways to look at this, at least. <clears throat> One is a culture is defined by those who are oftentimes most responsible for the organization itself, which would be your key senior leaders, right? So the senior leaders of an organization, if it's a large organization or a small, small firm or a startup even, uh, the leaders define the culture and they define the culture by their actions, their behaviors, what they do, what they don't do. Um, and, and this includes things like uh, the, the vision of an organization, the vision kind of helps define the purpose of an organization, the mission of an organization. Think about, for example, GGU, right? We, we know our mission. <clears throat> we know what it is. And, and that mission drives us in our work and it binds us together. So it's like when, when I know that a colleague works at GGU, it's like, okay, all right, I know what you're about. <laughs> I know what you stand for. You know, I know kind of the things that drive you, right? So things like mission, vision, your core values, uh, the guiding principles that help operationalize those, um, those core values, all of those uh, are intentionally determined and set by senior leaders. And, and then the entire organization uh, aligns with, for example, that vision, that mission, those set of core values, the guiding principles. So, Everything that happens underneath that organization or under the umbrella of the organization is intended to support uh, that vision and mission and strategy set by the leaders of the organization. And then as the organization becomes larger, often more complex, hmm. then, then all the different departments or entities in that organization, departments, sectors, industries, whatever, every every work that every aspect of work that they do, and it's all gonna be different, right? <clears throat> but nonetheless, everything that they do separately uh, as subsidiaries or departments um, should all align under that umbrella of the vision, mission, core values and guiding principles of the organization determined by uh, and sustained by the senior leaders of the organization. But then again, too, Mark, uh, it's important to note that <clears throat> even though the senior leaders are most responsible for setting, sustaining, supporting that culture. Everybody underneath the organization that's in a leadership position slash <clears throat> uh, a management position. So anybody who has a formal position of leadership and, or, or management, some kind of oversight responsibility for others, as well as informal leaders, those who really don't have particular title or power, but are highly respected by their colleagues. All of those individuals uh, really can do great things uh, in supporting the culture of the organization. So set up here, set at the top, determined here by the senior leaders, and then everybody in the organization who has that key leadership or management piece really then reinforces and aligns themselves in their actions and their speech with that overall vision. And but, all right, but it's not, as, as you said earlier, it's <laughs> not, it, it's about more than just setting it right you can't just will it into existence it's behaviors and practices and things like that right otherwise we could just say we're a happy family you're going to be yeah. happy right and that's probably yeah, right right yeah so exactly right um an organization that doesn't define its culture that just lets it kind of materialize right um where leaders don't really think about it they're just driven by productivity or the deliverables whatever the case might be which is important uh, business has to stay in business. But there are many, many cases of where the senior leaders, those most responsible for defining culture, have not paid attention to it. Hmm. And um, 
This happened about three years ago with an organization that, that I was working with. Brilliant, bright, talented leaders, senior leaders in the organization, as well as down the line to middle managers, um, were so preoccupied, as they should have been, with getting product out the door that they didn't really pay attention to the kind of culture they were creating at that same time, which was it's all about deliverables. Uh, the conduct and the behavior that we engage each other with really uh, is, wasn't paid attention to. And that's what eventually uh, really hurt that organization. They're, they righted the ship and they're doing great things now, but that's a great example where if mm -hmm. leaders don't pay attention to the culture that they want to create, they oftentimes end up with a culture they don't want. And once, yeah, once you have that kind of a culture, then you know, changing it, uh, it can be done, but it's really, really, really hard work. So yeah. you know, what, I've, what I've learned from, from this experience and many others is that leaders, especially with a startup, for example, uh, where the founder is bringing on people to build the staff, the team, they need to, at that earliest stage, define the kind of culture they want. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about a great, uh, a great quote from the late Tony Heisch, and I thought I'd just quickly read this as a way of kind of providing an example. Yeah, of, please. Of, uh, he's a former CEO of Zappos, passed away recently, very sad. But he said this, at Zappos, our belief is that if you get the culture right, most of the other stuff, like great customer service, or building a great long-term brand, or passionate employees and customers will happen naturally on its own. And so, I mean, that really captured it for a startup that just took off, where you define the culture, you sustain that culture, you give everybody what they need to thrive and support the culture, and just things happen by themselves. They, the, the outputs are just kind of a you know, a daily occurrence because you've got this culture that's just, you know, wonderful to work in, wonderful to be in. Again, when leaders don't pay attention to that, when they don't nurture that, when they don't cultivate that, when they just let kind of culture, assume culture is going to develop on its own and they can let that ride, it just can easily become a toxic and dysfunctional culture. Uh, and then you have a whole host of other problems. Uh, yeah, you right, right, right. So, so it's interesting. So Ed, it's not, as, as you were saying, you know, you had these organizations that you've been working with, and this is one of the things I know you, you spend a lot of time on in your, in your consulting. Um, it, you know, they were focused on their deliverables and their, and their, and their production, um, and they had neglected culture. It's, it, I think what you're saying, especially when you quote uh, Tony uh, Che, I think. Um, uh, oh, yes. Uh, um, um, that it's, it's not an either or sort of a thing, right? That culture really can... Uh, well, let me ask you, let me put it in the form of a question. Yeah. What is the relationship between culture and productivity? Yeah, case? yeah, great. Mark, great question. Um, <laughs> there's been significant conversation over the last 20 or 30 years around the kind of cultures that really deliver great performance. And the cultures that, uh, where performance is always a struggle. So, we would call these high performance cultures compared to low performance cultures. Think of it this way. It's almost like reversing the causal cycle. <clears throat> if, if I want someone who works for me to really perform at the highest level, then I've got to ask the question, what do they need to thrive? What do I need to provide for them? If it's just one team member, what if it's a hundred? What if it's a thousand? Uh, I'm thinking, what do these people need to thrive to do the best work they can do, to feel supported, to feel engaged, to feel I have everything they need to be successful? And when I determine that, I give them what they need, and that's part of the culture. It's like, you come here and you work for us. Uh, you're going to be engaged. You'll be supported. Uh, you'll be resourced. Expectations will be high. You got to deliver excellence. You're going to be working hard. But this will be an environment where you are valued, you're welcome to the table, um, you're supported, you have options, uh, there's celebrations, we do our work well and we work with professionals, there's always access to leaders and conversation that's going on all the time. 
so when you know the kind of experience you want employees to have, um, then that becomes a part of the culture, it becomes a part of the cultural norm. So you really define that carefully and how people are gonna thrive and what they need to engage. Uh, and, and when you don't do that, uh, when you, you actually create a weak performing culture and a weak performing culture looks like this. Um, I don't know what we, what we really believe or stand for in this organization. There's really nothing compelling here. The people that manage, uh, the people in management positions or leadership positions are draconian. They're, they don't care. They're driven by the bottom line. They say one thing, they do another. Um, we, we hire people that don't fit the organization. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any kind of alignment within the organization and thus morale drops. And when morale drops, typically performance drops. And when morale drops, uh, engagement drops, and then you have a, you know, just this cascading uh, issues uh, that just impact people in a negative way. So a high performing culture uh, is where people feel valued, supported, resourced, clear. We know what the organization stands for. Strategy is clear. Communication is clear. Senior leaders support and are available to and develop all the staff. It's just this beautiful back and forth where, where the vision, the mission are supported. The people have everything they need. Leaders are available. They're, they're speaking and they're acting consistently that, uh, in a way that supports the vision and the mission. We performing cultures don't have that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but now, but, value. I'm sorry, Jeff, yeah. No, um, but now, it, it's funny you say that because, you know, sometimes when I, th when I think about um, some really, I think, successful organizations, I think of what you're describing as essentially like toxic uh, work environments, like competitive work environments. So, uh, you know, for instance, I've heard of places where um, leadership will pit people against one another to, to see who can do a better, you know, produce more. And so it's a very cutthroat sort of competitive world, like uh, Amazon is one that comes to mind, uh, for example. Um, yep. and, and they're sort of successful, aren't they? Uh, even though there's that strange atmosphere going on there? Yeah, well, you know, uh, there, there's a difference. I mean, they can be successful and they are, uh, but at what cost? Um, so, so it's interesting you should mention Amazon because uh, Amazon, as probably everybody knows, what about four years ago, four or five years ago, four years ago, I'm thinking that the New York Times wrote a scathing article on the culture of Amazon, a ruthless, cutthroat, devastating, life-sucking, you know, morale-destroying environment. They're valuable. They, they deliver on time. But if you work there, you may well not emerge from that organization the same, meaning beat down, questioning your value, wondering what you have uh, to offer organizations. Yeah, the New York Times article was, was, um, was really, really ruthless toward Amazon. And I think it should have been. I think it's, by the way, fast forward now, that's one of the reasons why Amazon, you've been reading about the news of Amazon organizing. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why because it's just such a difficult place to work. Now, uh, can we say that Amazon is successful? Absolutely. Has Jeff Bezos has been successful? Absolutely. Uh, they're the largest and I think most successful company, one of the top five in the world. Um, every, everybody orders stuff from Amazon. And I gotta tell you, Mark, that I, I'm one of those persons. I order stuff from Amazon. And I, I don't, every time I click order, I just kind of go, oh man. I'm contributing to that toxic culture. Way to go, Jeff. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't obsess over it, obviously, but, but you know, it's like you can be successful. You can deliver product and just burn your way through people, which is what Amazon has a reputation for doing for years. Same and why do they do that? Because they'll just hire somebody else. They just keep on hiring people. And then when they encounter this, this trail of broken bodies, they just bring in more people. Um, it's, wow. it's really a great example of, of a toxic and dysfunctional uh, culture that is successful, but, but at what expense? And then I think it raises a, a bigger question of what's, what's the moral responsibility of an organization to people, to the human beings that work in there. And that's really one of the fundamental driving principles of why you have a culture and why leaders think about it, because it's the right thing to do. You know, it's like, it's, we don't want people just to boost the bottom line. 
to be productive. We need that. But we have a responsibility, a moral obligation to take care of these people, to take care of our, our employees. And, and we got to create a culture where they can thrive, where they can be uh, nurtured, where they can feel supported. I mean, there's a moral obligation there that, you know, I can get into that. But yeah, no, that's interesting. And conversation is huge. Yeah. And it sounds like there's a there would be a direct relationship between that and just their overall sense of uh, corporate social responsibility, right? Because the way they treat their own people is definitely going to be reflected in how they right. treat the community that they're in or, or, or the world. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's kind of like saying, uh, which for years was popular by organizations, they would say diversity is good for the bottom line, right? Yeah. I mean, that was that's about that's been bandied about for years, for years by corporate, corporate execs, diversity is good for the bottom line. I've always had an issue with that. It, and because it's almost like them saying, we want to make more money, we want to be profitable. And we've realized that if we pull that diversity lever, we're going to make more money. Uh, and so we want to be diverse, so that we can be more profitable and productive. Uh, we want to reach different clientele, a diverse clientele and diverse customers. Well, on one hand, there's nothing wrong with that. If, unless that's your driver, the reason that you think about diversity and inclusion is that you're going to you know, leverage that to make more money and be more profitable. Whereas I might say, well, diversity and inclusion and belonging and equity, you do that an organization kind of integrates and builds that into the dynamic of the culture because it's the right thing to do for the people that are there. Right, right, right. So, and oh, by so, the way, people yeah. tend to be more productive when they feel valued and appreciated. Right, 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 right. So I think what you're saying is there's, there's a distinction between having diversity as an intrinsic value, something that really matters to you, as opposed to something that you do for the sake of appearance, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the, the instrumentality or, or a utilitarian approach to diversity and inclusion, right? It's, it's, a, it's a leverage. It's a, it's a mechanism to get to somewhere else. Whereas you engage in diversity, and inclusion, equity, and belonging, because um, it's it's the end itself. That it's, that's not a means to an end. It is the end. You know. So right, yeah, that's right. that's it's kind of like Tony Heist said in his quote here. It's like if you take care of your people, if you build a culture where people can thrive, uh, if you build a culture where everybody's welcome to the table, no matter where they're coming from, no matter who they are, and the culture sustains that. Then, then performance and deliverables, and you, you know you have high expectations. It doesn't mean this is a soft culture where we sing kumbaya all the time and you know kind of give high fives. It's, we're not talking about that alone. We're talking about you know you do the people component and build a culture where, where human beings are valued. And the research says deliverables, performance uh, will just take care of itself. And I think the recently passed Tony Heisch would be evidence of that, that he created a, yeah. a company that did that. You know, so, so, so let me ask you, this, and, and that's interesting, you, you, we started talking about this. Um, there's a question in the Q&A about this very thing, which we have now answered. And I would encourage folks, if you do have questions, please post them in the Q&A. We'll try our best to get to all of them um, throughout the, the time we have here. Um, but I really uh, would, would, we'd love to see what your, your questions are about this. But um, uh, this this raises the question for me of an of another I think related idea which is um, uh, well what does it mean to to have a fit I, I mean I, I know if you're thinking about diversity then you're probably going to expand your your definition of who fits within an organization right but uh, otherwise there are a lot of people who just aren't going to be a good fit right I mean I guess that can work both ways positive and negative yeah oh, yeah yeah. Um... You know, we, we talk about that oftentimes, right, when we're kind of talking about businesses and, and who you hire and uh, how you hire. <clears throat> and, and companies that, this is interesting, Mark, and I'm glad you mentioned this, companies that have strong performance cultures, um, you know, where they just got a culture that they pay attention to and it's good, it's, you know, demanding, but it's good, it's, it's fair and blah, blah, blah. We've talked about that, right? So, so those cultures are careful about who they hire. And that's why, you know, we hear about these, you know, you and I've had friends and everybody who's watching, maybe even gone through this, but people who were hired by, you know, were interviewing for an organization or a position organization, and they, they were interviewed one time by one group. They were interviewed a second time by a second group. And then they were interviewed a third time by a third group. And then they were hired. 
or they weren't. Uh, you know, th those kinds of settings are indicative of strong performance cultures where they want to make sure that they have the right people who fit the culture. And fit means they, 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 have the, they, op they can operate with the norms, the values, the expectations uh, that is present already in the organization. Uh, if I say that someone's a good fit, I'm saying, man, they really, really get along. They, they feel like they can do their best work, that there's kind of an ease to them around navigating the team. Uh, they just, they seem that uh, this is a good place for them where they can really thrive and grow. Um, when we say someone is not a good fit, first of all, we have to be careful about why we're saying that, you know, maybe yeah. it's a thing, maybe it's, you know, they threaten me or maybe they're better than I am. But, you know, taking that off the table, it can mean uh, that someone really was not, someone who got the job is really not the best fit, meaning they don't have the portfolio, they don't have the skill set, they don't have the temperament, they don't really understand our business and they, or they can't work on teams and all of our work is done on teams. Um, and, and weak cultures, uh, low performance cultures, weak cultures won't pay that much attention to who they hire. They'll, they'll hire for technical expertise and knowledge, skill set, but they tend not to hire for things like, are they collaborative? Um, are they a team player? Uh, do they understand what we're about? Um, can they, do, do they buy into our vision or mission? So again, in weak cultures, that's even amorphous anyway. It's hard to tell. So uh, yeah, that, that's what, you know, I think the distinguishing between fit and non-fit, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Someone really fits, they can thrive. Um, and organizations work hard to make sure people fit. And the ones that don't, you know, they, they send them away. Uh, they, they don't make the interview process. They don't make the cut. And that's for good reason. Yeah. No, but I guess also, if you're thinking about it from the perspective of trying to promote diversity, the question of fit becomes a bit more complicated, right? Because I, I, I know there are organizations that say, well, that person doesn't have the right look, or, you know, or something like that. Uh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it can challenge when you, when you're serious about advancing diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging in an organization, then, you know, you better make sure if there's been a decision within the organization to really uh, move into DNI equity and belonging in a serious way for the right reasons, then you need to make sure the culture of the organization is ready to receive and welcome anybody who walks in the door uh, who's coming from any particular community of diversity. Uh, and that, that culture has to be ready. Uh, and so whether someone doesn't look like they fit or traditionally would not be perceived as, well, you know, um, they don't look like one of us. That's a good thing. An organization has to really be challenged by that. But yeah, the, the notion of fit uh, really begins to expand a bit. And just one more thing about that too. Yeah. When we're talking about fit, we're talking about diversity, uh, inclusion, equity, and belonging. Uh, if, if the culture itself uh, welcomes diversity, inclusion, belonging, uh, equity. How do we know that? Because a culture has already established that and everybody experiences that. We already know that. Then anybody who comes into that organization who has a skill set, the right skill set, the right portfolio, anybody who comes into that organization uh, is going to be welcomed and supported and valued and, and welcome to the table. Ah, got it. Because it's already sense. set as a cultural norm, right? Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Now, so, um, one, of, one of our attendees just posed this uh, conundrum, I guess, if you will, uh, Merlin C. Simpson, I'm um, saying Zappos, which you just cited as an example of a place with a positive culture, uh, now is owned by Amazon, which you also just cited for different reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that would seem to pose some challenges, you know, because that, that becomes a really complex uh, right. organization, right? So, so the, his question, I, I think it's, well, Merlin's question is, how does the right culture assert itself through that? That seems like a real... I, yeah. I mean, well, it's this, a merger of two yeah. very different cultures, I think. So you've got, you got a big company, a, a, you know, buying a smaller company, right? Right. So you've got Amazon. I don't think Zappos acquired Amazon, last I heard. So Amazon acquired Zappos. So the whole, the whole process in, basically includes that Zappos is absorbed into the Amazon culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there's respect and tipping of the hat to... What Zappos has created, but at the end of the day, we know who's going to win. We know what culture is going to dominate, and so 
um, that's hard. That's really, really difficult. And, and I think that someone who works for Zappos who really had this wonderful experience of a culture for years, uh, then has to make a decision. Um, do I want to work, you know, in a large organization with these norms and these, uh, these cultural values? Uh, do I, if I don't believe it, if I don't support what Amazon stands for and the way it's treated its people and uh, all the internal organizational behavior dynamics, then do I even want to work there anymore? And that's, that's a really, really tough question to answer, but it gets yeah. down, you know, so um, yeah, that's, that's kind of a, that's a tough one. And that's what I would say about that is, yeah, Zappos is going to be absorbed unless, unless Amazon preserves uh, the culture of Zappos, which it may well do. Yeah, they may, they may. Uh, so That's a, kind of a subsidiary, subsidiary of Amazon, uh, standalone by itself. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So um, we've gotten a couple of questions uh, uh, along the lines of something that I was going to ask you, um, which gets back to something we were talking about earlier on, um, which is about uh, leaders. Uh, let, let's say you come into a place um, like Amazon, or let's say someplace more manageable and smaller, um, where there is a toxic culture or just a culture that's not really aligned in the way right. that you were describing, right? Um, you, you come in as a manager. How, what can you do to change the culture to make it more in line with some of the principles that you were just describing? Is, is, that, is that easy? Well, number one, it's dangerous. I would say, <laughs> I would say that's, that's a dangerous proposition. Uh, you know, it's kind of like you're on a mission now to change the culture of the organization that you're in. Uh, I'm reminded of a really, really cool book by Kaufman and Sorensen written, I think, in 2016 called Culture Eats Strategy for Lunch. And so if you're hired into a culture, uh, if you're hired into an organization and the culture is a toxic, dysfunctional, you know, place to work. Um, you, uh, as a manager, maybe mid-level manager, maybe senior manager, um, you might set about the business of, I'm going to change this place and I'm going to change at least the sphere of influence that I, that I work in, but you may well be viewed as the enemy quickly. And you may view, you may be viewed quickly as someone who doesn't fit. Um, because even though you bring, a different set of operational procedures or norms or values with you as a manager, you're working in a larger culture that, that will not support you and does business differently. And, and that's why, thus with the title, you may have a very lofty strategy and a very noble strategy and a very virtuous strategy and a, a really rock solid strategy about impacting the culture, um, but you, get, you need to be careful. Because that's just a dangerous proposition. And as the book says, culture tends to win the day and you won't be around because you will be perceived as a threat to that existing culture, even though you bring in a set of healthier values and, and uh, you know, and a vision and just a way of getting and getting along with others and getting work done that is a, would be considered healthy. So that's, that's the danger that you run. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to avoid that, you make sure that as much as you can, right, Mark? You, you make sure that where, you're, where you wanna work is a culture that you can work in. I mean, you do your work on the front end. I mean, I, we, we need to work, we need gainful employment. We all need that. Um, and, you know, that's, that become, that's a driver. And the, the cultural fit for me, it may be second piece and I'll tolerate whatever I, I have to uh, deal with as long as I'm supporting myself or my family. Uh, but, but when that's not necessarily the case and you can choose, then you make sure that the culture of the organization to which you're applying and the position there, uh, really is a place where you can thrive. Hmm. Uh, so how do you do that though? I mean, so somebody's asked this question, yeah. can you, can you ask that during the job interview? I mean, uh... <laughs> well, you know, um, it's a, it's a yeah, tough question. I, I'm, I'm struggling with it myself. Like yeah, how would yeah. you I go mean, about yeah, that? Yeah, you can ask that during an interview. Yeah. You can say what? First of all, you read up about the culture. Um, you, there's, there's lots of information about most organizations unless they're privately held and they don't have to be as transparent as other companies, but you can find out a lot about, uh, about an organization's culture by asking questions. You probably already know a lot about it. If you have friends that work in that, that organization, you can ask them questions. Um, if, if an organization has a vision and mission, 
that's pub in public in the public domain and available information and the core values you can get your hands on that and if when you read that document uh, as you look at this potential employer uh, and you want to work for them you can see this information and you can probably quickly surmise that this is the place where i could thrive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know this is aligned with my values and i i believe i can work here and i bring a skill set that i know they want as opposed to doing your homework before in, in, on an organization's vision, mission, core values, you know, reputation, and you're going, man, there's just nothing there for me. I mean, that just would suck the life right out of me. And so the salary's good, the money's good, but I, that would kill me. Yeah, that yeah, it would. But, but um, it, I don't want us to, I don't want people to come away from this conversation thinking, there's no point in trying to change culture because that is that is something you've worked with folks to do, right? I, I mean, especially if you're coming in as a leader or or manager. I mean, what if you're somebody who's hired to promote the uh, you know diversity and equity and inclusion within an organization? There must be something that you can do, right? I mean, oh, steps yeah. or or. Well, you know, I, I I don't know if there's a clear cut specific plan per yeah. se. Yeah, yeah. The strategy out there, but let let's say that let's talk about an example, right? that um, a middle manager is someone's hired to fill a middle management position in a 500 member organization and the the culture is just really fuzzy it's it's uh, amorphous the, the vision the mission the strategy the availability of leadership there's, there's just a lot of um a lot of issues that culture has but there may be a wheelhouse or a pocket of the culture that really has potential hmm. um, if if you are hired with some measure of responsibility and power and authority, um, I think it's important to be able to leverage that, use that to begin to, you know, it's almost like to use World War II language, if I may, you know, establishing a beachhead on the beach, right? So, so if, if you could get a beachhead, just a piece of the beach, then you could expand that and expand that and expand that. And, and kind of in the same way, uh, if, if you're a leader or manager with some level of authority and responsibility, you can begin to kind of build that beachhead right where you are. Uh, and you can kind of expand that out. Uh, and the ability or the willingness of people to trust you as a manager or leader is based on your consistency, uh, the way you work with others. Just remember that you only have a beachhead and there's a larger beach that you don't have. So you got to be thoughtful about strategically how you're going to do this, um, how you're going to be working with people, communicating with them, managing up. And that's, you know, we talked about that last time, Mark, right? You got to be thoughtful about how you manage up, but there's ways yeah. to do it. Um, and it's, it's a slow process and it can be done strategically and tactically, but it takes time. It just takes time. And if it's a strong dysfunctional culture where the dysfunction is valued, then it's really, really going to be challenging. Um, you know, there's a quote that I was looking at earlier um, that I really had issues with, and it kind of resonates with what we're talking about here. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, this uh, it is the strength and cohesiveness of your team, not your company's culture, that matters most. Um, I don't know if I buy that. Now, yeah. I'll say this. Um, it's important if you're on a team in a large organization or you're a manager of a department, to, to really build the culture of that department, right? We talked about earlier, right? So if you, you got a larger organizational culture, you have all these smaller systems at work, cultural systems that then kind of support the larger, the larger organizational culture. So if you're a department chair or a manager or a leader or executive director of a department that has 200 people or smaller, whatever, um, you can build your culture there. You can create a culture that should be uniquely yours uniquely, you know, kind of aligned with uh, getting the work done there, you know, with your vision as a leader or manager, and, but also as a leader or manager, you got to make sure that what you do, the culture you create in that department aligns with and uh, is somehow connected to the larger organizational culture. It'd be the similar thing to Mark, you creating and helping to define along with your colleagues, uh, vision and mission and, and uh, for undergraduate, for the School of Undergraduate Studies at GGU. Mm -hmm. The process of doing that is creating a culture that's uniquely ours, but but we don't stand alone, right? We have we have a Gino, we have tax and accounting, we have a law school. So whatever we do independently, 
in our own schools needs to support and be connected to that larger vision and mission and core values of the larger university. So yeah, you can do it. You can start right in the middle somewhere. Um, it just takes time. Huh. So that's, that's the kind of beachhead idea that you're talking about, I guess, right? You start, Absolutely, you start yeah. someplace small and you build from there. Oh, interesting. So is it, um, by, by the you, way, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try doing this in a culture like Amazon because <laughs> you're going to get, there's no hope. You'd be there. swallowed I mean, up there, right? Yeah. yeah, you would. I mean, you'd be, yeah, something would happen. Probably. Yeah. It's my bet. Wow. Um, so you, we've talked a little bit, uh, we focused a little bit more on what leaders can do to, uh, to establish a culture. Are they the only ones who are responsible for creating and sustaining culture? They're the say? most, yeah, they're the most responsible most responsible okay they're the, mo uh, they're, the they're they're most they're most responsible right so um at the end of the day it's the, it's the senior leader of any organization any of them i don't care who they are uh that is is the most responsible for sustaining defining sustaining building shaping the culture um now i said the most responsible right not the only one responsible any kind of a leadership team they all share responsibility. Uh, middle managers, they all share responsibility. Um, employees, team members have the responsibility of supporting and advancing that culture. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody that, that is employed by that organization should be embodying and demonstrating the values of that culture, whether it's the culture of the team, uh, wherever they are, to, to support that, shape that, influence that. And again, I mean, just, just a line, let's say a line employee or someone who's been newly hired can, can establish their own sphere of influence around them in a way that supports the culture, right? So it's, it's the four or five colleagues I have, say, that I work with, um, or, or 10, you know, just kind of where I'm at. Sure. Uh, there, there's a group of people that I work with on a consistent basis. So how do I interact with them? How do we, how do we create a culture where we work together? How do we communicate, address conflict? support each other, listen carefully. How do we do that? Can we, can we create that pocket where, where that then extends and as we rub shoulders with others across the organization that that's transferred to them somehow. Um, so yeah, wherever you are, um, you can really create the kind of culture that is going to be helpful and hopefully connected to the larger organizational culture that's in a good place or a healthy place. Ah, nice. Okay, that's that. So, so there's hope, is what you're saying. You can you can sort of shine a light in the corner where you are. I suppose there, there is. Just just remember that culture is a big. It's an 800 pound gorilla. It just is. It's always going to be that big 800 pound gorilla, and you, you got to be careful not to get squashed. Uh, it's slapped aside. Uh, you can just say, "I'm going to go my own way here. I'm going to show." this place, what it means to be a leader and a manager, and I'm going to stand up and speak my mind. Well, I would say, good knowing you. <laughs> you know, I'm being facetious, but really not. Um, yeah. It's an uphill battle, though, certainly, right? It's, absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I'm thinking about how that relates to, again, uh, to circle back to this again, uh, the, these questions of diversity, equity, and inclusion that we've been talking about a, a, a lot more this past year. Uh, one of our one of our uh, attendees, uh, Lisa Giuliani, asks how, how can you start contributing what you learn about this and what's what, and just what's going on in the world to enhance or or to even establish uh, a, a DEI culture in an organization. Right. That's that's got to be a question that a lot of folks are asking right now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that uh, a number of people that I know. I'm thinking of Price Waterhouse and some other organizations that um, if I haven't worked with them, I've collaborated on some projects with them. I maybe a couple of years ago, we did something with Price Waterhouse Coopers here in San Francisco um, where we had like a panel and uh, some of some of my colleagues at GDU were involved in that. And so, um, you know, I think it's, I think that when you're thinking about diversity, inclusion, belonging, equity in an organization and how you advance that as an individual. Um, I think number one, you have a lot of conversations uh, with colleagues. Um, they're open conversations, they're learning conversations. They're trying to build understanding conversations, especially when you're talking to someone who's very different from you and has a different experience from you. You have those conversations, you listen, uh, you feel. Um, so it's not only the one-on-one -on -one piece, and as you have those conversations, you're always examining 
your inner, you know, unconscious biases, sometimes conscious biases and stereotypes and, and uh, just, you know, things that you know in your own mind, I've got to deal with. I've got to address these things because I've never really attended to them and they have to be addressed. They've got to change. So it's a one-on-one. -on -one. It's rubbing shoulders with people and having conversations. And not one-offs. I mean, these are constant conversations. And then you're, mm -hmm. you're really given an uh, opportunity by the organization to have whether their town halls, whether they're special interest groups where people can gather to talk about specific issues uh, that belong to diversity, that connect to diversity, and uh, where people who share some, some values and, and themes and identities and traditions and histories that uh, that they can connect from and learn from and bring others in who can ask questions about that. So if if a larger culture can say we want to welcome uh, diversity, inclusion, equity and belonging, uh, we want to celebrate that. We are now going to create processes and opportunities for people to have lunch together, to have coffee, uh, Zoom virtual uh, encounters where they can talk about a topic or a theme. Uh, those, those are ways that you can begin to build and advance DE and I and, uh, and B belonging, um, in an organization. So yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the organic way. Yeah. It's also, yeah. can also be kind of a top down press where, and that also needs to be important too, where you have policies, processes that are fair and equitable and do advance and recognize the contributions of a diverse community of employees. Uh, and you have the matrix and the data that that indicate, you know, this is an organization that takes <clears throat> DE and I and and B seriously. Um, one more thing, Mark. I know I'm kind of riffing on this, but you know, <laughs> the, the uh, when an organization has a strong culture in general, I mean, it's strong. People are performing. They want to be there. It's clear why they're there. Um, and the organization <clears throat> has. Um, a real clear policy and process and statement and actions and processes and avenues for everybody who comes from a community of diversity or who has a unique identity that they believe is a part of really who they are in their work and, and their community. Uh, these organizations create opportunities for that. And they welcome um, a broad section of employees with broad experiences from a variety of communities with a variety of beliefs, but when they come under the umbrella of the organization, guess what? Um, we, we are there for a purpose. We're there for a mission. We're there with these guiding principles and core values, uh, and we thrive there, and we learn from each other. Uh, now, here's the one thing I want to say about that. You have that kind of a culture. People are going to be banging down the door to get in. They want to work in a place like that. So, so your retention goes up. Right. You're, quality of your hires goes up, your retention goes up. Um, people who want to work there, if they can get in, if they can make it through the interview process and they're welcome to the table, uh, they're not going to want to leave. And that's, that's really a, an advantage of an organization that has that's a strong key. performance culture is that right. when you feel welcome and you feel supported, uh, you feel you know, valued as an employee, no matter where you are, uh, the vision, mission, core values are clear. In diversity and equity and uh, inclusion, belonging, or experience on a daily basis, then who would want to leave that? Yeah, but it, it sounds like it's not—it's never a settled thing. Like culture is never just like, all right, we've done that, let's move on. You've got to continue to pay attention to it. It, it evolves, it changes in response right. to what's going on in the world. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You have to sustain it. You've got to keep your eye on the ball, and and uh, that brings a great point, Mark. And that is that even though you've got a, you've established a solid nurturing, performing culture, you know, it's just a great place to work and you work your backside off, man. I mean, when you, when you're working, you're working hard, but you, you love it there. Uh, you can't rest on those cultural laurels. I guess you could say, uh, leaders continually refine shape, um, and sustain culture. And by the way, when, when the culture needs to be tweaked, when there's an experience nationally, globally, uh, that really demands we we got to make a mid course correction in this area, so we're gonna we're gonna get together. We're gonna rethink maybe some aspects of our mission, our vision. We're gonna add some core values that we've never had before, and we're gonna begin to move this to the organization. Uh, we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna give time people to understand this and and embrace it. Uh, so yeah, that happens 
when it needs to, but that's something that can really only happen when leaders are paying attention to culture. Hmm. Okay. I, I'm talking with uh, Jeff Yergler, by the way, I should have mentioned this earlier, um, who's a, a professor of management and department chair at Golden Gate University. Um, and he's also principal for uh, integer leadership. Um, uh, so Jeff, we have a couple minutes left. I have uh, one or two more questions for you. Um, uh, one is uh, from one of our attendees. And um, the question has to do uh, with something we were talking about earlier, um, getting back to uh, hiring and the idea of fit. So I hope you don't mind me going back to that uh, for a moment. Um, but uh, uh, Branch County asks, uh, we, you know, we try to balance the importance of qualifications with the importance of fit, but tend to periodically get pushback about not hiring the most qualified. Uh, can, you, can you speak to this? Is, is this a common concern, this idea of like what's more important, uh, skill set or fit? And, and how would you handle something like that? Yeah, you know, it's been an ongoing dilemma for as long as I can remember in organizations, you know, who do you hire? Um, do you hire for talent, expertise, um, <clears throat> or do you hire for fit? Well, I don't, I mean, I, personally, I would say, I, I don't think I've ever had an organization. I've, I've worked with an organization where they hired only for fit, uh, but it was a consideration, right? So, so for me, what I've seen is this model. Uh, we have a position description. We want to hire someone with this, this experience or this level of education, since we're in an educational institution. Uh, they, they have to have a minimum of a bachelor's or a master's um, and kind of a history of working in these types of organizations doing these types of things. Um, and, and here, you know, we have, we have a set of core values and guiding principles that really are important as well. So the hiring process where you're trying to honor the technical expertise and who the person is, you know, the, the diversity, equity and inclusion and belonging piece that, that's in, that enriches the hiring process, right? So this is who I am that enriches what I do with the organization. Right. And so I think, it's, I think it's the entire package. It's the entire portfolio of who the person is. But I know that if you need a specific position filled that requires a specific level of expertise, then that really is the driver. But it's not the only driver. You're also considering the person, education, who they are, their experience. Uh, will they add to the richness of the conversation? Do they reflect? Does a person reflect um, kind of the values of the organization, who they are, where they're coming from? So it's, it's not a clear cut line of demarcation, right? It's, it's we're looking at the whole person and we're mindful of the whole person. And we're mindful of the kind of position that, and the experience that we need, but we also recognize we want a person that brings a, a wide variety of experiences in terms of where they're coming from that's going to enrich us as a culture and really sustain us and strengthen as a culture. Hmm. And I, I know that's something, I'm just going to plug something you're working on in passing, but um, I know that's something you've incorporated into your new degree program at, the, at our school, School of Undergraduate Studies, the Organizational Leadership and Human Skills Development Program, which where you're thinking about I know people don't like to call it soft skills, but but all those sort of things that are a little less uh, easy to measure that you that right. you're describing, right? That that's really a part right, right. of the programs. Yeah. So so the organizational leadership and human skills development degree, really the the, the core courses, you know, that really focus on um, human development. What do we mean by that, right? So we're, we're talking about developing and growing and and uh, sustaining and nurturing uh, students, anybody. Um, to really be a well-rounded, just someone who's who's who has the expertise, technical knowledge, who also knows how to connect with others, who knows how to collaborate, who knows how to resolve conflict, who can work on a team, who understands leadership, who understands you know how to manage change, um, who who can influence people moving forward. So these all require uh, you know a human connection. Uh, and a, a value and an appreciation for who people are and where they're coming from. Uh, so so it's, it's a degree that says, here's the technical expertise. Uh, you're bringing that with you because you're probably already a working professional or you're just starting out. So you got knowledge already, but it's a human dimension, the relationship dimension, the community dimension, the interaction together that really does move an organization forward in a way that is, is unique. That if you didn't have that skill set, only technical expertise, 
uh, it would be a liability. And I think organizations have told us this over the last 15 years. Quit sending us people that are just smart, <laughs> send us people <laughs> that are intelligent and yeah. really know how to work with others. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're getting a couple of good comments in the, in, in the chat here about this very thing that, uh, that these questions of, uh, of uh, qualifications and fit, it, they, they can be married together if you're considering okay. how, how the person can advance the organization's values and goals, and, right? W whether those goals are productivity or just be, being the kind of environment yeah. that people want to be in, that's, that's really important. So. Yeah, you know, I, I remember there was a time, so I'm a young man, but I, I have a lot of work experience. So I remember there was a time when diversity and inclusion and equity and belonging, they weren't even on the radar. Right. In hiring processes, HR processes, they weren't even on the radar. It was all about, hey, do you have the skill set we need? You're going to help us make money. Uh, are you going to perform? Then we want you. Uh, that's totally changed. Uh, that's still important. But now we've got this human dimension piece that organizations realize because it's the right thing to do, right? We talked about it earlier. We, we want to marry. We want to connect this entire picture of, of a human being. Uh, so yeah. technical expertise, experience, identity, um, where they're coming from, uh, their vision, their hope for what they want for this organization for themselves and what they can bring to us. Yeah, all critical now. Absolutely. And, and then uh, another comment here says that it's important for the organization to make that clear to prospective employees as well, that this is what they're, what they're striving for and give them a yeah, sense absolutely. of... absolutely. I mean, we, I know we just got a couple minutes left here, yeah. but the, the, the hiring process for any organization... You know, it used to be it was a hiring process and an onboarding process. Just kind of you did it, right? <laughs> this is insurance. Here's where the bathrooms are. Here's where you go to park. It's like, you know, if, if for many organizations, that hiring process, we talked about that earlier, three, four rounds of interviews, and then the onboarding process. Now that onboarding process is where, you know, you, you've got someone who's made the cut, who's gone through the interviews and Everybody's going to be working with that person says, yeah, they're a good fit. You know, we want to work with them. Now it's the onboarding process where they discover, you know, this is kind of who we are. And this is where we can learn from you. And this is what we'd like to offer you. This is who we are. This is the DNA of this organization. And, yeah. and we would love for you to contribute to that. But this is what we believe here. Now, the person's probably already going to believe that and know that. But there's some things that you can't know until you're inside the family system, as they say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, this is great. Uh, Jeff, of course, I have a dozen more questions to ask you. Some I brought with me that I'm not getting to and some that are in our, our chat here that uh, we won't have time for. I, I do wanna um, say a couple things. Um, one is, um, this is part of a series, as I uh, mentioned at the outset, uh, on leading and managing during turbulent times. In future conversations we, uh, that Jeff and I are gonna have, uh, we'll address in more detail, I think, uh, that. The three levels of addressing diversity, inclusion, and belonging is one. Uh, adaptive leadership in a crisis, which we haven't really explored in this conversation, uh, and, and a couple of other topics that will uh, be rolling out on a regular basis. So, um, uh, Jeff uh, Jurgler, I, I really want to thank you for taking the time to uh, share what you, what you know, which is I, we've only got the tip of the iceberg uh, of that just now. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, all of the things you're, you're, you're sharing with us right now. Um, a couple of things I want to mention. Uh, if, if you have a friend or, or colleague who'd be interested in what we just were talking about, this will be posted to GGU's YouTube channel uh, shortly. And um, uh, by all means, feel free to, uh, uh, to point people to that. We'll, we'll share that link with, with everyone here as well. Um, I also especially want to thank uh, Joyce Martin for being our uh, producer today. And um, also, you know, one of, the, one of the things I never do and I should do more often is just thank all the folks who make GGU Presents possible. And uh, that's Michael Baisley, Shoki Monfred, uh, Brandy Howard, Great Audrey work, Tilson, and uh, Joyce Martin. Uh, they all have done quite a lot of work, and I, I get all the credit by showing up and just getting to talk to interesting people. So uh, just want to thank everyone. But Jeff, in particular, uh, if people want to know more about this, can they find Integer uh, Leadership on, on, uh, online? Absolutely, yeah. If you, just, if you Google Integer Leadership uh, or just my name, you'll, you'll, you'll be taken to the site. So it's there. We'd love to help any organizations that are asking questions about, you know, how do we make our culture a strong performing culture? Love to do that. It's a lot of fun and it's just an incredible journey. So yeah, it's online. That's great. That's great. So a anyway, I want to thank everyone for, for attending today. We're really looking forward to the next, uh, the next one. Uh, we've got several 
uh, episodes coming up in the next few weeks, actually. So, so stay tuned for that. We'll be posting those and they'll be available on, on our website and uh, on Eventbrite as well. So uh, thanks to all of you and we'll, we'll see you really soon, I hope. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Mark. All right, thanks.